Okay, welcome back to the show, and I've got a great guest for you today. It's Mr. Steve Diamond. He's a TV star that you may have seen from Netflix Tiger King 2, also a magician and the owner of LifeSkillsMasterclass.com and many other things that we just found out off air as well, which we'll get into. Steve, how are you doing, man? Hey there, buddy. It's so nice to join you and your listeners in Ireland, of all places. Yeah, it's it's strange. Like we're we're based out of Ireland, but most of our guests are American, and therefore most of our viewership and audience is American. But here, but here we are in Ireland talking anyway. That's because in America, that's where you find all the crazy people. So uh, they make great guests on your show, I'm sure. There's a lot of intriguing people in America. I, I, I won't call them all crazy. Let's let's just say intriguing. <laughs> okay, we'll use that word. Yeah. But um, just a bit about yourself. Obviously, a lot of people will recognize you from Tiger King 2, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But can you give us a bit of background into what you've done like pre that? I know you're a magician. You have other things that you do as well. I just want to know, like, when did you get into sort of, I guess, entertaining people, I guess? Well, um, I've been doing it all my life, really. Um, it started when I was seven years old. My father took me to an amusement park in Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, Virginia. And just as you walk through the entrance of the gate, over to the left, there is a replica of Shakespeare's Globe Theater. And it was there I saw my very first magic show. And uh, after the show, I asked my dad if I could be a magician. He said yes which was a pivotal moment in my life because in that moment when he said yes, it was like getting the stamp of approval from your, your dad. And so I never looked back and I was like, okay, a magician is what I'm going to be. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. A hundred countries later, over 10,000 live shows. And uh, I officially retired from my magic career in 2008. Yeah. I actually had a, an Irish magician on the show before. Um, he, he's done a, a lot of crazy things. I, I'll send you on the video, baby, at some point. And uh, his name is Davy McCauley, and he was telling me about what kind of magic oh, yeah. he does and that. So, what was your style of magic? We'll say because I know there's various other, various different styles of it. Well, it started out uh, simple enough with you know tricks from a local magic shop, and as I got better and better and, and my career grew, I ended up in the corporate arena and started doing a lot of corporate shows. So I kind of became the corporate king for a while and was touring all over the world, really, um, in, in my early teens and, and early 20s uh, doing corporate shows for some of the biggest Fortune 500 companies out there. So I did uh, Grand Illusions. I had my own uh, touring illusion show, which had lions and tigers, of course. And mm -hmm. I did, um, you know, everything from sawing a lady in half to levitating a car and making it vanish in midair. So you could see pretty much any kind of giant wonder in my show back in the day. That's crazy. And I always ask this question, whether it be people in music or whatever, does one memory stand in your mind of something is going to go wrong here or did something go wrong or did something, what's the funniest thing even that you've ever seen happen during a show? <laughs> I got a great story. Um, there's so many, you know, in a magic show, uh, uh, what people don't realize is that it's a highly technical form of art. So uh, in order to create that wonder on stage, behind the scenes, what you don't see are a myriad of people that are running around making the magic happen. So um, all of these, the real show I always say is backstage. Um, but there was this one particular time when uh, I was performing on a cruise ship. I was had my own ship on Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. I was a headliner wow. for uh, a few years. And I lived on the ship for 10 months at a time. And so, um, you know, performing on a cruise ship has its own challenges because you're, not only is the stage moving, but the whole theater is moving. So at any time, anything could happen. And we would, you know, regularly have rolling tables that would roll across the stage on their own and things like that yeah. because of the, the listing of the ship. And this one time I pulled this lady out of the audience and she was an elderly lady. I would say she was probably in close to 75 in that neighborhood. And uh, there were a set of steps on the side of the stage to get her up. 
So I brought her up on stage. We did the whole routine. At the end of the routine, I told the audience, you know, let's give Mary a big round of applause as she goes back to her seat. And as she was going back to her seat, she tripped on the top step and she fell all the way down to the floor. Now you can imagine the horror that I was experiencing. This elderly lady had just tumbled down this entire set of steps. And I went running over to her and I go, ma'am, you know, are you okay? Did you miss a step? And she stood up and brushed herself off and she looked back and she goes, no, I think I hit everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but you were, you were obviously scared that, you know, that she could have been seriously hurt. So you got a nice story out of it. She wasn't. Fortunately, she wasn't hurt at all. She she took it in stride and it brought the house down. I mean, for like 10 minutes, the audience was just in hysterics. And she was so funny, so good hearted about it. It was, you know, it was a great experience. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you touched on the audience there. Like how how pivotal is a live audience to a show? Oh, it's everything. You know, when I first started in magic, my mentors, uh, Doug Henning, who some of your audience might remember from the 70s, uh, he had a lot of um, national TV shows here in the United States, which have since been seen around the world. And then, of course, David Copperfield was just coming onto the scene at that time. They were kind. And there was a third one, uh, Harry Blackstone and Siegfried and Roy. And I would say that group would probably be my mentors. And I always kind of gravitated more towards Siegfried and Roy. I liked the showmanship, the exaggeration. I liked the larger than life aspect of who and what they were and everything that they did. So I kind of gravitated in that uh, direction. And I remember very early in my career, I got to meet the incredible mime. Some of your listeners may uh, remember his name was Marcel Marceau. I'm not sure if in Ireland he was as well known as yeah. he is in the United States. Yeah, and I've Mar heard of him. Marcel came to see my show and he was fascinated with uh, a couple numbers that I used to do in my show. And he came to see me several times. And um, I remember Marcel teaching me one of the greatest lessons that I ever learned in show business. And that was that it wasn't so much what you did. It was more how you did it that was important. And so that clicked with me. It really resonated deep. And I began to realize that entertaining that audience was the key to my success and making everybody in that audience laugh hysterically and, and, and inviting them to come with me on this emotional journey of a roller coaster uh, I think that that uh, was the key to my success. So it became in the later years, it became less about the magic and it became more about the entertainment and the production value that I created. Yeah, because I see it like a lot of magic shows now. And there's a couple here in Ireland and a couple that to be screened on TV. And like a, a lot of it, maybe we'll say 50 to 60 percent of it is like getting somebody up from the crowd to participate in it. And I think it kind of helps people. I think they feel more included when stuff like that happens as well. It, it does. And I think it's more entertaining for the audience. And to be honest with you, the audience members are far more hysterical than I could ever be. And so when you get those real people out of the audience and create those situations that are just going to produce a lot of really funny stuff, you know, the audience can really relate to that. And then it makes those people the hero of the night. And, you know, yeah. when they leave the theater, they're kind of a little celebrity on their own. And and that's just good vibes for everybody. Yeah. What way you're looking out at a crowd will say, you know, people probably in your mind, OK, I can't pick this guy. I can't pick that guy. Mm -hmm. How do you select who you bring up? Obviously, drunk people are out of the equation straight away. Sometimes, sometimes the drunk ones can be the best part of the show. It just depends. You yeah. know, that's a great question, uh, Morris. I, I'll tell you that um, you, when you do as many shows as I've done in my career, you become an expert 
at the behavioral sciences. You learn how to read people in just a few seconds. I mean, think about this. I've done over 10,000 shows in over 100 countries around the world. So I've literally shaken the hands of more than a million people. So when you have that kind of experience in your life, it gives you the ability to be able to look at someone and size them up instantly. And you know what you're going to be able to get from them. And you also know what you're not going to be able to get from them. So I can generally, within the first two or three minutes of my show, I've got the four or five key people uh, that I'm going to pull out throughout the entire show already selected. I know who they're going to be. I know who I'm going to get for this trick and I know who I'm going to get for that trick because I'm reading the audience in those first few minutes and I'm looking to see who's alive, who's responding, who's laughing, who's having a really good time. You know, and those are usually the people that I gravitate to. The ones that are sitting in the front, I always call them the, the rich people. Uh, when, the, <laughs> when, the, when, the curtain, when the curtain goes up, the whole front row is rich people and they sit there like this. Mm -hmm. You know, they impress got this me. Attitude. Yeah, impress me. Entertain. I paid a lot for these tickets. You know, impress me. I ignore those people. They're they're totally irrelevant to me. They're they're not even interesting people. Uh, the people that I really connect with are the ones you know, the fifth row back. Uh, those are the people who who are really going to bring the show to life. They're there to have a good time. Yeah, because a lot of people as well would kind of refrain from sitting in the front row out of maybe being scared from being involved in the show as well. Yeah, and I'll give you an example. Billy Joel and Elton John actually have clauses in their contract that they do not allow the first two rows to be sold at all. And they wow. give those tickets away. They actually go into have people that go into the audience before the show and they find people in the worst seats and they bring them all the way to the front and sit them down front. And as an entertainer, that's who you want. When that curtain goes up, you want to see those people who are excited to see you and are excited for what's about to happen. And so that's a that's a great thing. I really expect uh, I really respect performers that do that. Yeah, we're going to talk. We're going to gravitate into the tiger king mm -hmm. stuff but before we do obviously sure. you were you were doing tricks involved with animals and i'm fascinated to hear about what kind of work you were doing with animals sure well we had you know every trick in the book over the years i did everything from make turning girls into tigers to uh transforming myself into a cheetah uh all kinds of, of different illusions that we had uh in the show uh, throughout the year we had ducks and we had hawks and eagles and i had snakes and um lions and tigers and bears oh my and what else did i have um cockatoos I had parrots, I had parakeets. So I, I had a tremendous uh, uh, array of different animals in my show over the years. And is that why ultimately they Netflix came calling to you to be a part of this project or how did it come about? Well, they started contacting me years ago. Um, they wanted me to be in the first one and I turned it down. Um, in hindsight, probably should have done it, but I had spent, you know, 25 years of my life trying to get as far away from Doc Antle as I could get. And yeah. so I didn't want to have anything to do with him. So when they began contacting me and, you know, were telling me what the series was about, and I knew that they had already interviewed Doc when, when they uh, approached me the very first time, as soon as I heard his name, I was like, absolutely not. I want nothing to do with it. I just want to be as far away from this individual as I possibly can. And he and I have not been in the same room since June of 1994. Um, and the last time I saw him, he tried to kill me. So why would I want to be involved in anything, you know, with him again? And so uh, they kept trying to contact me every six months or so. I would get an email or a call from a producer and, you know, they were sweet talking me. And I had a very successful career here in Las Vegas. I was a corporate producer and I worked on a lot of big shows, um, you know, residencies for people like Cher and Lady Gaga and Katy Perry and uh, Britney Spears and a whole host of others. 
And so there was no reason for me to go back at that time. Um, and I just didn't want to be involved with it. And then when Tiger King came out and I saw it, um, they contacted me again and said, what do you think? And I said, I have some real problems with this. And so we started talking about the issues I had. One of the big issues I had is that they made Joe Exotic seem to be this lovable, bumbling character, and I knew otherwise. And there's a very dark side to Joe, and I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail uh, about, from his fans uh, about that. Yeah, it's but it's it's you can you can you can say whatever you want. Like I've had I've had Carol Baskin on the show, and then I've had Rinky, and Rinky's on about saying all this stuff about carl it's like anyone that i have on the show i always give a kind of open platform so you can say what you want and it's not going to bother me because everyone's entitled to their own well, opinion yeah yeah it's you know it's just the truth and i mean i think joe was set up and framed i think the charges that he's in jail for now are absolutely bogus and i think they need yeah. to a judge needs to release him immediately um but but Joe has a nefarious past, just like all of these animal people do. I mean, they're all cut from the same cloth. And the vast majority, not all of them, but the vast majority of them are criminally connected, let's say. And so I just want to stay away from that group of people, from that type of element. It's just not who I am. It's not what I'm about. Yeah. And what kind of what swayed you then to participate in two was it kind of seeing how popular one was but obviously wanting to give your opinion on things as well were they the two deciding factors or what way did it balance for you you know someone made the statement that we're going to tell your story whether you're involved or not mm. and when you hear that um it kind of gives you pause and you stop and realize, okay, I have two options. I can ignore this and let them say whatever they want, or I can be a part of it and try and control the narrative as it relates to me. And so um, I decided that I knew that they were covering um, the, the whole situation with Mark Topping, or as I call him, Mitra. Uh, yeah. the employee who disappeared under mysterious circumstances and ultimately was found dead at the bottom uh, of a cliff. And so I have a very strong connection with Mitra. Um, he was a very central, key, important figure in my life in those early days. And so we were best friends and we spent thousands of hours together talking uh, having long philosophical conversations. He was super intellectual, super smart, very intelligent guy. And I felt in some of the pre-interviews with some of the producers that the story that they were they were going to tell about Mitra was missing some key elements. And um, I felt that someone needed to speak for him. And so I, I just felt like there was a real need for someone to stand up and go, this guy was an amazing human being. You know, he was, he, he really could have made a difference in this world had he just been given a chance. And that ultimately was the deciding factor because all four of my lawyers told me not to do this. Wow. I was getting all my legal advice was don't touch Tiger King with a 10 foot pole. They're all suing each other. They're suing Netflix. You don't want to be a part of this. And so I had my lawyers on one side telling me no. And then on the other side, I just felt Mitra. I felt his presence there saying, Stephen, you know, tell the story, tell the real story. And um, so I gave them a list of demands and I said, look, I'll do it under these conditions. One of the conditions was that they had to give me all of the, que the questions in advance. And uh, there were over 250 questions that they sent to me, and I was willing to answer all of them but two. Okay. And in, in terms of Netflix, like I've talked to various people involved in different Netflix projects, and they don't seem like they're the easiest people to deal with but in terms of they want to take a story like Tiger King and they want to make it the way 
they want they believe that the audience will find it the most entertaining do you find that looking back on these two series that it's kind of it's just geared because who do you think anyone came out of tiger king one or two looking good or looking respectable or if so who do you think did wow uh there's there's a lot to unpack there <laughs> yeah sorry um, for First, let me say my experience with Netflix was absolutely fantastic. Uh, okay. Netflix did everything they promised to do for me. Um, their staff behind the scenes was absolutely amazing. Uh, Rebecca, the executive producer, Rebecca and her producing uh, partner, Eric Good, um, they were fantastic. Uh, they were they were very, very caring, uh, very interested Um Anything that I said, you know, if they proposed something to me and I wasn't comfortable with it and I said, you know what, that, I just don't feel like that that's true or that wasn't my experience. They didn't they didn't have a problem with taking it out uh, or not going there. And so they were very respectful to me. Um, but I think to a large degree, they needed the information that I had. Uh, yeah. Because I was there since day one. I was there from the beginning, you know, and it was my magic show that was bringing in the bulk of the revenue, um, the big dollars anyway, back in those days. So um, it was a story that they needed. So I got, I think I might have gotten a little bit different treatment than some of the others uh, yeah. did. And yeah, in terms but... of who came out smelling like roses, well, I think all of the people who are innocent who were telling, you know, who were victims of yeah. uh, the, the different characters back in the day. I think they all came out uh, smelling like roses because they were telling the truth. Um, there, there wasn't a single person that I saw anyway in the entire series that really wasn't telling the truth, except for some of the nefarious characters. You know, but the victims, the girls who were raped by Bhagavan, um, you know, uh, I'll tell you, Radha in particular, uh, who was the, the, the beautiful long haired, uh, girl in the Doc Antle story who looks like Cher, um, yeah. you know, her, uh, Radha, when I first met Radha, I was told by Bhagavan that she was 22 years old and uh, 21 or 22 and that she was, uh, his wife. Well, it turns out, and I didn't know this until I was filming Tiger King, um, when we were filming, Rebecca stopped me during filming and she goes, Stephen, you don't know, do you? And I said, no, what? And she said, how, do, how old do you think Radha was at this time? And I said, well, she was 21. She was married to Bhagavan. And I could tell by the expression on Rebecca's face that something was you know, not amiss. And I said, well, yeah. what's going on? And she said, we just did an interview with her and she was 14 years old at that time. And that was the first moment that I knew about the fact that all of these girls that Bhagavan was with were underage. Now there were some back in the day that I was suspicious of, but I, that's not where my focus was back then. And I wasn't paying any attention to that stuff because my focus was on building my magic career. Yeah. And I was just using the animals as a gimmick, as a platform to build that career. And to a large degree, it worked. But there was a lot of shady stuff that was going on behind the scenes, which I just didn't pay any attention to at the time because it wasn't my focus. Yeah. And then when I'm sitting there filming and they tell me that she was actually 14 years old, I actually went home that night and went back and looked at some of the old video that I have. Um, and started looking at, at, at those pictures really carefully and realizing, oh my God, she could have been 14. And, and it was really a shocking thing for me to, to learn that. And then I started going back in my head and thinking to myself, oh my gosh, were all those girls in the jacuzzi underage? What about the girls in the back of the van? What about the girls, you know, at the ranch? What about the girls at Yogaville? What about, you know, and then it just, unleashed this whole plethora of questions that I had um, thinking back about all of these girls, the runaways that we would pick up on the side of the road, going to a gig, 
you know, all of those kind of things. I'm like, how old were these girls? Yeah. And do you think <clears throat> since the publication of two that since a lot of these issues have been brought to public knowledge now, uh, are you happy that kind of or do you think that justice is going to be served for all this? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. The jury is still out on whether justice will be served. Um, yeah. I have absolutely zero faith in the judicial system in my country. And that's a very sad statement of affairs. Yeah. But it's the truth. I just don't trust. Bhagavan, in 40, I've known this man almost 40 years, if not 40 years. We first met in 1983. And I can tell you that he has never been held accountable for any of the major stuff that he's done. Uh, a lot of it criminal. And um, so he's a very super intelligent guy, a very slick and slippery type in individual. And so he's never been held accountable. I'm not sure he ever will be. Now, people have said to me recently, yeah, but now he's dealing with felonies. Well, yes, he is dealing with felonies. And some of them have penalties that are up to 20 years each in, in prison. Do I think yeah. he's going to be in trouble? Yes. He's also worth millions of dollars today and has a tower full of lawyers that will get him out of whatever the case may be. So there's that. Yeah. A, a lot of the, the things he's dealing with at the moment though are kind of financial stuff rather than the underage things and other crimes that he committed really. So maybe there, maybe it's the start of things to come, but who knows? Well, I've spoken to a lot of the investigators working on his case. And I will tell you that the reason that there haven't been charges brought up is because of two reasons. One, none of the girls want to testify. And number two, these are things that happened 30 years ago. Yeah. So it's not like that they can dig up evidence. You know, there's not video footage. It was a different time back then. We didn't have cameras everywhere like we do today. No one was carrying TV studios in their pocket like we have today on our phones. Yeah. And so none of that existed. So keeping that in mind, you come to understand that digging up evidence from that far back is really, really, really difficult. Yeah, so it might have to be something or something he done more recently, maybe that might get him in trouble, which leads me to the big story in yesterday in America about Vince McMahon. Have you heard about that? No, I, and I know yeah. Vince. What, what happened? You know Vince well. He's uh, allegedly... You have to use that word um paid one of his employees uh two hundred thousand dollars to uh cover up their affair and that will rise to three million over the next two years and the new york times broke this news yesterday which would be obviously a very credible source it's not just wrestling rumor and uh yeah you should check out that story when you see it but vince like is always vince has always been um known for being like a uh, the crazy billionaire but obviously a smart businessman at the same time but it seems like questionable decisions questionable decisions he has made recently in his life may be yeah. catching up on him you know I'll, here's what i'll say about it. vince mcmahon's a genius there's no question about it the man yeah. when it comes to marketing and promotion he i think there are a few people that are as good as he is um that having been said Something I've learned in my life and in my career, being around some of the biggest superstars on the planet and being around so many celebrities and famous people, you will find that with every person out there where there is this uh, genius to them, you're going to find this equal and opposite dark side. And so I, I think that that's true across the board. Um, I, I've, I found that in my own experience, meeting these people and getting to know some of them, you know, there's always going to be a dark side and usually it's equally as great as what they're known for. So, um, you know, take that for what it's worth, Yeah, but I'm definitely going to check out that story. Oh, it's a big, big story. It's, uh, it's one that's not going to be able to be swept under the carpet in 2022. Let's put it like that. <laughs> okay do you want to talk to me about 
life skill masterclass your website sure. and the story behind it and what you do for people well you know it it actually goes all the way back to the days of uh, my association with doc antle um a lot of the trauma that i experienced back in those days um stayed with me and haunted me long after i had separated from him and i eventually ended up in therapy to deal with some of these issues and it was while i was in therapy that i learned a certain set of skills that literally changed my life and i began to realize that i started asking my therapist why don't why isn't this taught in schools? Why don't people know that if you just do these things and you just learn these set of skills that your life can change and be so much better? And there wasn't a good answer. And one day my therapist said to me, why don't you be that person? Why don't you be the person that teaches these skills? Why don't you write a book? Why don't you develop a course? Why don't you... And that started me thinking. And at that time, I was still on the road. I was still touring. So it was really, really hard to do. And um, so the last few years of my career, I was on a cruise ship. And I wrote a book and published it in 2006 or seven. I can't remember when. And Jane Pauley, who is a famous journalist on NBC here in the United States, she read uh, my book. And she called me and said, I want to do an interview with you. I'm about to publicly announce that I have suffered my entire life with stress, anxiety and bipolar disorder. And she said, um, I would love to do an episode with you to come on and tell your story. So we did. And after that appearance, I got tens of thousands of emails from people all over the world who identified with what I went through. And people were reaching out to me for help and they were saying, please help me. You know, I relate to you. What happened to you happened to me. I went through that and I didn't have any resource at that time. I just had written a book telling my story. So um, it started me thinking and I was like, you know, I need something. So I created this. Actually, I have it right here. So this was the first version. This was a four CD audio course, um, had four CDs in it. And this was the original version that I created after that. And we sold hundreds of thousands of them. And so that made me realize, oh my gosh, there's all these people out there suffering. And I started getting all these emails from people who had bought the course, taken it, and they were like, oh my gosh, this ha has helped me so much. So that was the first iteration. And over the years, uh, it just grew and grew and grew. And I kept adding new skill sets and new information and new stuff. And in March of this year, I rebranded the entire course. We filmed a brand new updated version of it. And it became what is now lifeskillsmasterclass.com. And so for people who want to learn how to stop the, the stress and anxiety in their life, how to manage their emotions, how to change their state, how to stop panic attacks, how to make better decisions in their lives, things like that. Go to Life Skills Masterclass, check it out. Each week you get a, a 30 minute video lesson where I teach you a certain skill. And then you have the next seven days to work on that skill and implement it into your life. And then you get another lesson. and I teach you a new skill and that's um that's how we do it. It's been very very successful, and it's it's obviously it's a one to one basis as well for people, isn't it? Yeah, you know it's a go at your own pace. So and that's what people love about it is that they can do it on their schedule. There's no set schedule. You don't have to you know attend a class at a certain time. You can open your laptop or any device, your iPad or your phone or whatever. You can take the course any way you want to on your schedule. And the other good thing about it is that there's inside of the course, there is a place called the Safe Place Community. And that is an internal message board uh, boardroom where you can go in and there's people in there 24 seven talking and you can always connect with people who are going through the same things that you are. And there's a lot of people that that for them is the best part of the whole thing. They really enjoy interacting with uh, with the other members in the course. 
Yeah, because a lot of people would probably find themselves maybe in the same boat and have a lot in common and be able to talk to each other about various different problems. So that's a, a nice little part of the website there as well. It is. And I also have another program where I spend the vast majority of my time in major corporations teaching uh, corporate employees about stress in the workplace and how uh, teaching them skills to, uh, for example, getting along with people you hate, but you have to work with them. You don't <laughs> yeah. like them. You can't stand them, but you yeah. got to work with them. How do you do that? No one teaches us how to do that. So I created a very special workshop called Stress in the Workplace. And so I go into corporations and do keynote speaking, workshops, seminars, all kinds of things like that. You can find out more information about that stuff at stephendiamond.com. Yeah, which I will put in a link underneath this video. Um, for yourself then, with the website, obviously you've done the Tiger King stuff. Is TV something that you would ever consider getting into or do you have any plans to, to do any more TV shows or series or anything like that? Yeah. In fact, there is a documentary about my life currently in production. Excellent. Um, so, so they're working on that right now. Um, we're, you know, getting all of the footage together, my old uh, footage and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're, we're, we just began the process about six months ago. So we're er in the early stages of it. But um, it's it's very exciting. Uh, that's one project. I have been deluged by producers from reality TV who have offered me all kinds of reality TV type shows. I've turned most of them down um, because it just isn't on brand for me. I don't want to be a contestant on a show like Big Brother <laughs> or anything like oh, that. Yeah, um, It's just too vicious for me. And I'm not a vicious person. So I don't want to be, you know, in a competition type thing setting. Uh, I, 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 I might accept being a judge on some sort of program or something like that, but wouldn't want to be a contestant. Most of the offers I've gotten have wanted me to be a contestant on the shows. Yeah. Anything that stands out to you? That's the funniest one that you've got. Oh man. There was a, there was some show in the UK. I, I can't even remember. It was a horrible pitch um, where I was going to be doing all these challenges and getting in the mud and hanging underneath helicopters. And I was like, uh, I, did that. I was like, I did that in the 80s, um, you know, and I, I turned that that down. Uh, there, there's a bunch of shows like that. If, if it's contestant based, I don't really it, it's just not right for me. Um, but anything that's positive and uplifting and supportive and that sort of thing, I, I would look into that kind of thing. We have a version of a show I've created that is being rewritten at the moment, which we intend on pitching out there, uh, but it's not ready yet. Um, but we're still working on the pitch for it, but you might see that on the air someday. Yeah, and hopefully, if we do, we might get you back on here to talk about it. I would love to. I would yeah. love to. And I would love to come to Ireland sometime and and uh, do a keynote speech or a meet and greet. So I'm sure you might see me out that way sometime in the near future. Yeah, if you're ever over here, hit me up. I'll be there, man. We would brilliant. love to see you. Yeah, it was brilliant to talk to you today. Thanks so much for your time, Stephen. Oh, I'm so grateful. So grateful. Thank you so much uh, for having me on. And uh, say hello to all your Irish friends. Best of luck, man. Take care. Bye-bye.